So welcome to the Beyond Biopsychosocial Training Program. I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors, Dr. Kang, Philbrook, Jacobson, and Cuddyford. This module focuses on self-efficacy and its application to clinical care. The module is divided into three sections, motivations, basic, and lastly, some examples of how, to, how this scale might be beneficial to apply in practice. Our provider beliefs and values are important. Until recently, we might have defined our role in the healthcare system as to improve the health of the person through movement. But recently, through new research and calls to action, it may read now, and psychology. A good example of this call to action is the pain revolution talk by Stephen George at the 21st Malley Lecture of Physical Therapy in 2017. He really asked us to radically change our entrenched education, research, and practice patterns. So we chose the self-efficacy of symptom management scale because it's a positive psychological trait and it's changeable clinically. So what is self-efficacy? It's a person's belief in their capabilities to perform certain behaviors. It's considered to be the focal determinant of task-specific behavior, and it recognizes the influence of beliefs on patients' perceived ability to perform physical tasks. To understand how to improve self-efficacy clinically, psychological theories like social cognitive theory can be helpful. Self-efficacy is seen as a central tenet of achieving specific goals that later become integrated into your everyday life. Outcome expectations modify these goals, and then also socio-structural factors and facilitators also modify these goals. But sometimes self-efficacy can be strong enough that it overrides these mediators. What this suggests to us clinically is that our job is to address outcome expectations by generating hope, challenging negative beliefs, and reframing past experiences. It also encourages us to deal with the social structural factors and facilitators like family issues, work pressures, and environmental issues that might prevent somebody from participating fully in rehab. And finally, to have meaning for the patient, it focuses in on goals and behaviors that are relevant to the lifestyle that the patients wish to live. This particular model is well accepted and provides an initial framework to start developing psychological approaches to care. Here we review evidence-based approaches to improving self-efficacy, and they include persuasion, vicarious experience, skill mastery, and self-regulation. So let's start with persuasion. Therapists can focus on outcome expectations by talking about prognosis, recovery patterns, and other expected changes in their physical abilities that may occur over time. They can also use objective measures to challenge patients' beliefs about their bodies. For example, EKG to challenge your heart is strong, or physical performance tests and providing age match norms to understand their performance. Vicarious experience recognizes the influence of others on a patient's perceptions. If patients identify with the struggles of another that's similar to them, they may gain confidence when seeing them succeed. So we can tap into vicarious experience by creating shared experiences which include co-treatments and group therapy. We can also use skill mastery, and this may be what most of us are familiar with when we talk about graded exposure, where people's expressed uncertainty, doubt, or fear is stepwise challenged with different tasks to kind of build confidence and improve their belief in their ability to perform those tasks. And finally, there's self-regulation, which recognizes how cognitive thoughts can limit a person's participation in physical therapy or rehab processes. So negative thoughts, negative beliefs, poor outcome expectations can cause them to panic or restrain their participation. So through cognitive approaches to challenging negative beliefs and discussing some of their automatic thoughts, we may be able to either create positive thoughts about participation or train them to mitigate or tone down their negative ideas. Another good question is, is there evidence that focusing on self-efficacy can help? 
First, new theories that integrate psychosocial care all identify self-efficacy as important. A recent systematic review finds that higher levels of self-efficacy in patients with musculoskeletal pain has many benefits related to prognosis. And then in a study that we performed in patients with musculoskeletal problems attending primary care, we found that the promised self-efficacy of symptom management scale was equally as predictive of health status as more traditional scales like physical function. And finally, in a submitted study, we've also found that health status is better predicted by the combination of self-efficacy and other physical scales like physical function and pain interference than either one alone. So what are we learning? We're learning that self-efficacy is a key determinant of behavior change in some psychological models, and that self-efficacy is modifiable, and there are specific techniques that we can use, and that self-efficacy is linked to many factors, and that identifying these factors requires skill, and that skill is in psychological therapies, and that evidence shows that self-efficacy is connected to health outcomes. So now we've covered motivations. Now we move to the basics of integrating the promised self-efficacy of symptom management measure into practice. Self-efficacy of symptom management defines self-efficacy as a patient's confidence to manage, control their symptoms, to manage their symptoms in different settings, and to keep symptoms from interfering with work, sleep, relationships, or recreational activities. Here's some items from the item bank. I can still accomplish most of my life goals despite my symptoms. I can manage my symptoms during my daily activities. I know what to do when my symptoms worsen. And then patients are asked to rank the confidence that they have in these different statements. And that's what determines the T-score. What's important is that all of the patients have to have symptoms for this scale to be relevant. And so the reference population for this particular scale is not the U.S. population and instead is people living with chronic conditions. However, it achieves person-centered status by including lots of different people with lots of different kinds of chronic conditions, including neurologic and arthritis. So let's see how this changes our typical interpretation of a T-score. Now the mean is the average confidence people have compared to other people with chronic conditions. So we can see in this sample at initial evaluation from orthopedic patients, we can see that most of the patients are shifted to the left are below 50. So a high score is more confidence and a low score is low confidence. And we can see that these individuals have much lower confidence at their initial evaluation. And the average is about 44.2 or about a half standard deviation below the mean. For floor and ceiling effects, we can see some scores are low and there also can be higher scores, but for the most part, patients score around from 30 to 70. So they're about two standard deviations below the mean or two standard deviations above the mean, meaning that a score of 30 is, is somewhere near the lowest confidence level this scale detects. And then higher confidence levels compared to other people with chronic conditions are achievable. The acceptable zone or when patients find their, their symptoms and activity acceptable is associated with about a 45 in terms of confidence. So if they're within a half stern deviation of other people that manage their chronic conditions, they typically find their physical abilities and whatever symptoms they're having as acceptable. So now we look at patients at discharge from physical therapy. For these same musculoskeletal patients, we can see that they've now achieved confidence about equal to other people with chronic conditions on average, and that many more patients are shifted above 50 or near the 45 mark that is the acceptable zone uh, for symptoms and physical activity. Now we move to the ability of the scale to detect change. And a rule of thumb is about a half standard deviation similar to the other scales. But just to reiterate that we have identified as a threshold of 45 as the level above which patients typically find their level of symptoms and activities acceptable and below which they find their activities and symptoms unacceptable. And so a good target for us is is to try to get to 45 when patients have low self-efficacy to begin with. 
So what we are learning, one of the newer promise measures is self-efficacy of symptom management. And we expect more data on interpretation to involve. Our initial results are positive. It's identifying many different people with problems and confidence and negative beliefs. And we're able to use it effectively to target psychosocial approaches to those patients. So that concludes the basics of interpreting the promise self-efficacy symptom management scale. So now let's move to application. But before we do, let's just review some of the tenets of this model so we can see how the therapists are using this model in their clinical practice. Self-efficacy is confidence and belief. It's modified by outcome expectations. And so socio-structural factors and facilitators can be really important to kind of facilitating goals and building self-efficacy with the final kind of goal of this kind of behavior change. And so I think you'll, if you listen carefully, you'll find all of these represented in the different video vignettes. Let's review this case of a female patient that had a right knee replacement when she was younger, a right hip replacement recently, and now consulted physical therapy for left hip pain. Over two visits, she had a dramatic improvement in physical function and decrease in fatigue. And then she demonstrated self-efficacy that was about equal to the mean of other people with chronic conditions. Honestly, as like a clinician, I didn't feel like I spent a ton of time treating up here. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe through certain questions, yeah. um, maybe going for the fact of asking about social roles mm -hmm. or asking like, you know, why... Why don't you want to have surgery? Mm -hmm. What's so bad about surgery? Yeah. Um, I think the. So, how was the change then between like the first session and then the mm -hmm. second session? Yeah. Yeah. So, second session, she improved in self efficacy and I think in physical function. Actually, yeah, she did improve with physical function. Both of them were up in MCID. Wow. So, really interesting because we didn't spend that much time mm -hmm. on joint motion and um, testing and all that. It was all about getting her, because um, I went after physical or self-efficacy first, mm -hmm. um, hoping that with self-efficacy, maybe that may in turn kind of show a mismatch mm -hmm. that sometimes patients may have a perceived low physical function because self-efficacy is low. Right. So that's why I went for self-efficacy first. Um, and it seemed to help out in this case. Wow. So are you saying then maybe that self-efficacy helps with physical function? Or physical yes. function helps self-efficacy maybe? Right? Yeah. yeah, I think that like thinking about a mismatch of between perceived physical function, mm -hmm. I think if you haven't tried certain activities mm -hmm. um, or maybe you, you have this perceived threat that if I do these things, it may in turn mm -hmm. worsen my physical function or I may because I feel like I don't function optimally, mm -hmm. I don't think I can do these certain things, yep. like go for walks, be able to go to the gym mm -hmm. and, and do squats. So unless you've, you have self-efficacy and you feel like you're confident mm -hmm. that you could do that, mm -hmm. I think, yeah, there's no way that you'd be able to, if you didn't have promise, you would not know that yeah. there's that mismatch. Yeah. So let's listen to the provider and patient talk about how self-efficacy got built in during this rehab session. So this is a cardiovascular case. The patient had a myocardial infarction, refused to attend rehab, was called by the PT, and then achieved these scores here in green. Remarkable improvement in physical function, decrease in fatigue, and self-efficacy that now matches other people on average with that have chronic conditions. And note that they're final discharge physical performance measure was five to six mets. How about, how about your walking speed? Like I've noticed like you're walking a lot. I have no idea. I don't have you around to time me anymore. Yeah, but no, you're walking so much faster. Have you noticed that? Actually, I know I have noticed that. Yeah, I'm walking like a soldier now. I, yeah. uh, before I would totter along, yeah. and now I, uh, I could really walk well. Yeah. Huh. Hey, do you remember the time where we went to a football game together? Do you want to talk about that? <laughs> That was so fun. I mean, we, we, we had to go up a 
whole stadium and because uh, the the was great and uh, you, you kept encouraging me telling me I could and uh, I uh, finally believed you and uh, we had a good, just a great time and yeah. we ran into people we knew and talked to them and so what I, I do with my patients a lot is I talk to them about their heart and what would make their heart strong again Mm -hmm. Right, so we have a slogan here like heart strong, right? That's something we talked okay. about. Yeah, and when I said that, he says, Do you really think my heart can be strong again? Oh, okay, so you were really getting at something he was thinking about. Yeah, I think that that's the direct correlation. Like, we can talk all day long about exercising, but I think until you're really motivated about the disease process or the pathology, right? That, mm -hmm. that really drives them. Mm -hmm. And so, I said, Every time you exercise, you're actually strengthening your heart. And I see that with your EKG, and I said, and, and there's other things that can help your heart, like you know, losing weight, right. you know, wa eating, watching, and eating some better foods. He was pre-diabetic at that time, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So we talked about that. So we talked about nutrition, and what happened is that he started using graded exercise as a way for him to gauge to see how well he was doing. So mm -hmm. he would be like four minutes today, you know, six mm -hmm. minutes. Even he started tracking. I see work. Like, when can I go back to work? What can I start doing the things I want to do again? And one of the things he really wanted to do was actually go to a football game. Oh, really? Because he's a sports writer. Right, right, right. But he was right. worried about climbing upstairs. Oh, yeah, right, right, because of the stadiums, right? That's right. And yeah. so one of our goals is, and he talked about that in, the, in this video, is the fact that um, one of the things I said to him is, like, let's go do it together. Right, and so you know, we 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 purchased tickets together, and we went to a game. Really, where, where and so there's a here at Fox. At Fox. <laughs> and the funny thing is, is that I made sure that we got the tickets that were on top of the stadium. <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> so so true, right? He didn't know because I'm like, oh yeah, they have great views up there, right? And he's like, he goes, well, I trust you, I trust you, Doc. Here I go. Lifestyle, right? So right. we, I knew that we had to do that, yeah. And that was one of his like final steps because usually climbing steps is about five point five minutes, okay. And so like, but you know, so to, to be technical, it's like six minutes. You start thinking maybe the patient can be discharged. Right. So if you're climbing up steps at 5.5 minutes, then you know that they're closed. And so this was kind of a, a way of like ch changing out yeah. his his, um, uh, his physical therapy and then going into a community-based exercise program. Mm -hmm. So we had a program for him. So he d actually did climb it up. Wow. And he, when we got to the top, he, he, he was breathing hard. But he looks at me and goes, you're right. The view is great from here. <laughs> That's when I knew I got it. I hope what you're seeing in this particular module is the impact of the person-centered approach and how it leads to a much more collaborative relationship with the patient. In summary, this module re reviewed the promised self-efficacy of symptom management measure. It identified some psychological models that we can use to address self-efficacy. It also showed and demonstrated the link between self-efficacy and physical abilities and introduced the social cognitive model and it tried to inspire the idea that psychological approaches can be challenging and rewarding in patient care. That concludes this module of the biopsychosocial training program.